By using the DOE work and QBD approaches, you can identify the more robust region within a particular process. And this is work uh, at Pfizer, a uh, particular data set, looking at optimizing product titer and a particular quality attribute. And you can see these different contours of the DOE work. And not surprisingly, we take this data and we try to identify regions of operation. And it's fairly simple to utilize the data and further optimize. So we go from a uh, titer of about 1,900 mg per liter of uh, antibody and maintained within the appropriate product quality by operating within this white space. And by uh, optimizing the process, we can achieve a slightly higher titer and improve that margin of safety on that particular quality attribute. But what often happens is we end up confine, confining the process, or constraining the process further. And you can see if, if we want, we can further optimize the process. Uh, here we've moved from an 11-day process to a 14-day process. And all, in all these cases, we're further constraining the room for operation within this manufacturing process. And this is how often QBD has been applied on the process control side, at least uh, within cell culture manufacturing processes. So rather than taking that approach of always constraining our manufacturing processes, what we wanted to do was envision a different world where we take uh, our knowledge from QBD and PAT and really develop adaptive processing steps. This is direct language from the guidance document speaking to the fact that we can really enable an alternative manufacturing process where rather than always controlling our input parameters tighter and tighter or our operational space tighter and tighter, instead we, adapt a, we create an adaptive process where we're better monitoring the process and then better able to implement controls to ensure product consistency. And with that, I'd like to jump into a particular case study. Uh, this happens to be an antibody manufacturing process. And I'm going to speak specifically about uh, the disulfide bonds of this IgG1. Uh, folks are familiar with it. This is the pictorial of an antibody. And you can see that there are four interchain disulfide bonds along with 12 intra-chain disulfide bonds. And with this particular process, the challenge we faced was uh, what we called the UDB, under disulfide bonded species. Uh, what is it? It's a partially reduced antibody where not all the disulfide bonds are intact. Um, the issue is, is not particularly problematic when we have low levels of UDB. Um, it's predominantly a reduced upper hinge disulfide in general, it's stable, remains intact throughout the purification process. However, uh, at high levels of UDB, what we see is all the intrachain disulfides could be affected. And more problematically, uh, this high level of UDB in the bioreactor leads to uh, high molecular weight aggregates, which is considered an impurity in our bulk drug substance. Uh, we actually had one manufacturing batch fail at large scale. Uh, and and large scale for us is about 6,000 liters. Here's data, viable cell density on the y-axis and culture time, looking at some bench scale runs in red, and then two large scale runs at 6,000 liter. You can see from that first 6,000 liter run, uh, unexpected performance, much lower density than we had intended in this process. Uh, we made a change on the fly. We increased the agitation rate, uh, thinking perhaps there was a limitation there. Uh, we did improve the cell density, we still saw a decrease in viability. And what was most problematic was this high molecular weight aggregate, this impurity that was seen in run one. So what did we do? We took that, that QBD approach, really focused on trying to understand the different aspects of this phenomena. Uh, biochemical, biophysical analysis and characterization, uh, molecular and cell biology studies, Actually, we implemented some metabolomics studies to look at this particular problem uh, within this particular aspect. 
Uh, we did bioreactor process development studies to really understand which cell culture parameters affected this uh, and understanding uh, aspects of the bioreactor engineering. Uh, and characterization of our large scale equipment. Clearly we had seen differences between large scale and small scale. And then we implemented some development campaigns. Now in terms of this particular product, product A, what we saw was uh, reduced, um, the antibody was reduced using high free sulfhydryl containing condition media. And what you can see here is a control sample and then incubating it in conditioned media containing high free sulfhydryls. And you can see that reduction in, in antibody. Uh, the intact antibody is this top band and then partial species uh, in all these other lanes once we incubated it. This gave us an understanding of what was going on with the UDB. And in particular, what we're seeing is free sulfhydryl levels in the conditioned media correlated well with the UDB. Now we can measure that with the condition media elements assay, and we observed that delaying the accumulation of these reductants led to lower UDB or prevented UDB. We also identified a number of process parameters that could affect this reduction of the antibody. Here we looked at two different agitation rates uh, and batch duration. This is a SDS page, and you can see with uh, increased batch duration, day 7, day 10, day 12, day 14, we see increased levels of these partial species, the undesirable species. And at the higher agitation rate, we're seeing much more of these undesirable species. So with this particular product, again, it seems to be susceptible to cell culture stressors, uh, which shifted the redox state of the conditioned media. And this led to uh, UDB generation. And in some cases, um, we've looked at this with other processes, in some cases this high level UDB uh, leads to the increased high molecular weight species. Now, not only did we need to understand the, the process itself, we needed to understand how this high molecular weight formation was occurring. How did it convert from UDB to high molecular weight? In our process, so what we have here on the left-hand side is the process steps, uh, what we believe the UDB high molecular weight status is at these different process steps, and the disulfide bond status. Uh, in the bioreactor from day zero to day 14, we go from low UDB to high UDB, but still at low high molecular weight aggregates. Uh, and we have increased levels of free sulfhydryls on the antibody itself. As it goes over the first uh, purification column step, the protein A, we have this low pH elution, it's meant to inactivate virus, and then a pH neutralization step. And here's where we see a conversion of high UDB to low high molecular weight species. Um, and what basically is happening is a rearrangement of disulfides. Some reform, we get intact antibody, and in other cases we're seeing the high molecular weight aggregates, the undesirable species. We identified a number of cell culture process parameters affecting UDB, from aeration agitation of the cell culture, uh, culture temperature, uh, the shear that's occurring in the bioreactor, a nutrient imbalance in the media, and also C density and target temperature shift density. This process uh, uses a temperature shift, occurs midway through the process. From the DOE work, it's a pretty complicated set of factors that were involved and interactions that were involved. And you can see this equation that relates all these factors and interactions and allows us to predict levels of UDB in the, in the bioreactor. Now at this point, we could have just constrained the cell culture process. We could have said, yep, we've learned from DOE. We know what's going on. We know it's a cell culture phenomena and left it at that you know, lowering process temperatures, lowering C densities, lowering temperature shift densities. You know, the, the con though here is while, you know, product quality would have been maintained on a typical process, if there's ever a deviation, we'd be susceptible to those problems. Uh, and those things occur at large scale on occasion. Uh, additionally, by lowering these process temperatures, C densities, we decreased the productivity of the process. So it made it more robust, but the trade-off was a lower productivity process, which, of course, our upper management frowns upon. 
So what we could have done alternatively is impose additional requirements on downstream process. We could have added an additional step, a third purification step. Uh, that, however, you know, leads to process complexity, increased costs, decreased yields. Uh, alternatively, uh, interestingly enough, we have a TME step in the purification train. We could have modified how that step was operated and would have allowed for um, better removal of high molecular weight aggregate. But the trade-off is decreased yield, which is undesirable. Uh, here's that TME step. And what we can see is uh, pH levels on the y-axis and salt concentrations on the x and different amounts of high molecular weight aggregate removal depending on the loading of that column step. So essentially, we do our DOEs at in the cell culture side, purification is doing their DOEs on the purification side, and they're understanding how their process better operates. They could have operated at a region that enabled better high molecular weight aggregate, but that trade-off is lower yields. So what did we think about doing? What do we finalize um, as our control step, our control approach? What we did was develop this adaptive process step. Using the, the guidance documents on PAT, uh, the de that definition, it's a system for designing, analyzing, controlling manufacturing through timely measurements with the goal of ensuring final product quality. You know, timely measurements, perhaps of the critical quality attributes or performance attributes, or maybe raw or in-process materials and processes. What we ended up doing was using those tools that we had developed to understand this process, the Elman's assay, apply it directly to the bioreactor samples. There's our timely measurement. And then the response was modifying how we operated our downstream step so that we only modified that downstream step if we knew UDB was present. So rather than always taking a yield hit with every run of the process, only take that yield hit if you needed to ensure product quality. Here's this, uh, what we call our UDB decision tree. We analyze the bioreactor samples using that condition media elements assay, or alternatively, we've developed a redox probe and an approach using that, which enables um, less sampling. Uh, it's a bit more robust. Um, if we have low signal, there's no further action. We just operate our downstream process as we typically would. If we see a high signal, just confirm it, make sure it's not an assay artifact. Um, you know, eliminate whether it's a, an assay or sampling issue. If it is, you know, no further action, continue downstream normal operation. If we do confirm that signal, we modify those downstream process operations. So in conclusion, what we're able to do is use QBD, PAT, to really enable a strategy that ensures final product quality. It terminates unacceptable batches early, so we avoid non-value added work. Or alternatively, we save batches by proactively modifying our downstream process steps. And then with these real-time measurements, we can maximize productivity, allows for risk mitigation of the presence of high molecular weight in the final drug substance. Actually, we've been able to avoid high molecular weight testing or uh, SEC testing of our drug substance and pushed it further downstream where we do that testing only at the drug product stage. Uh, so in, in summary, for this particular case study, uh, High level UDB in the bioreactor can lead to high level high molecular weight aggregates uh, and the purification stream ends up in the drug substance potentially, uh, causing potential failures of batches. Uh, the situation's not unique to product A. It happened to be a process that I worked on, seemed to be more susceptible to these issues, but we've seen it with at least two other programs. Uh, there are a lot of cell culture parameters that can affect UDB. They're complex, they're difficult to fully understand unless you utilize DOE to understand those interactions. But by using a PAT initiative, it allows us to maximize productivity, minimize the risk of high molecular weight in the drug substance. And I'd just like to, to thank my bioprocess R&D colleagues, our manufacturing colleagues, our analytical uh, R&D group, 
and our support staff.